Hello, everyone. Is everyone good? Can they hear me? We'll just wait for everyone to join. I think we have a few more people joining on. So we'll just wait a couple more minutes. We just have like two minutes till noon, so everyone should get started. Just a reminder though, um, while we wait for everyone to join, to please mute and end your video, just so we, everyone has enough connection to do that. Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you so much. We'll just wait a few more minutes here. So we just have two minutes until 12. Hey, Nicole, can you hear me this time? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So we, we switched the platform we were doing this on. You guys want to see some behind the scenes while we wait for everyone to join? <laughs> That's what this looks like. Had to get everything else set up here. So let's see, do we have anyone else? Okay, so we have a couple more people joining, but we just have just another minute here. This is the workshop that we're in today for anyone that is curious how this will look like. So that's pretty neat. It's a massive workshop here at AMCAN. So that's kind of cool. Okay, it's noon. So we're probably gonna go ahead and get started and then everyone else can join as they see fit. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started in about like 30 seconds here. Okay. So thank you for everyone who is participating today. We had originally wanted to do a series of hands-on lunch and learns, masonry demonstrations with all of you for the architects and engineers. Um, we had originally were going to partner with Intuitive. However, due to recent events, that was no longer a, po a possibility. So uh, we decided to do these virtually now for everyone. So thank you again for everyone that's joining. Um, David Leonard from Intuitive will be moderating so he can, you can put some questions into the chat and he can answer um, as he sees fit. And I can also pause and answer questions as we go along. So please pop them into the chat as we go along. I'll be answering them and addressing them to the AMCAN staff. So with that, um, just a quick couple of pieces of housekeeping. Please uh, mute yourselves and your videos. Turn off your videos and just make sure that your connections are good um, and so forth. And then we can go ahead and get started. So I will be now the voice behind the camera. You won't be seeing me again. I will be filming the AMCAN crew. My name's Nicole Miller and I'm with Alberta Masonry Council for those of you that don't know. And I'm gonna pass it off here to Candy from AMCAN Masonry. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us in our virtual install. I hope this not only educates you a little bit, but I hope to give you a laugh in the long run when you see me try and lay brick. I am not a certified Mason. I have been with on the supply side for many years before I joined AMCAN and now I'm learning the labor side. AMCAM Masonry started in 1995 by Steve Jilt Sr. He was also on the supply side and learned many things about the different products available and decided to go out in the field and create beautiful structures using masonry. As we go through everything today, you will see that uh, AMCAM supports, of course, AMC, MCA, a bunch of Canadian masonry, uh, CCA, which is Canadian Construction Association. We're involved in as many associations as we deem fit in order to make sure we're at the forefront of code changes, solutions, 
make sure we sit at the table to make your jobs easier in the long run. My name is Candy Benninger. I am the business development side of AMCAM. Over here, we've got the unbelievable Les Pruden, our senior project manager. We are eager to help you with any of your upcoming projects. We will partner with you for design, specifications, and budgeting. Feel free to reach out at any time and we will help you along with your projects. Right now, let's get started. Okay, so we're gonna be talking throughout this with the various masonry materials that we'll then be building for this wall. So to start off with, what's the base of this wall? Well, we have some block here. So we have Les from Amcan Masonry and Candy is going to come and be his Vanna White. <laughs> it's so funny doing this because everyone's trying to stay as far apart as possible. Okay. okay we'll start out with these two blocks, the charcoal looking one and the buff. They are architectural block made with a heavyweight material. This is a split face, so it's after the blocks are made eight inches wide, there's a guillotine that comes down and snaps it in half. This is a four inch burnished architectural block. Burnished means that the face is ground off to give it a different texture. Here's what it would look like if it wasn't burnished. And of course, this can be used as a smooth block texture for an architectural finish. Typical blocks are, are a standard gray lightweight aggregate block. Most common is usually the 20 centimeter. In behind, we have what's called a 20 centimeter bonding that's used <coughs> For, for the uh, horizontal bond beam, the concrete, these pieces here are knocked out and rebar, depending on what's required, one or two pieces of 10, 15 or 20, 20 mil bond beam, a rebar per bond beam are knocked out and then filled with grout. And over the side candy is a 30 centimeter. That's, that's what we like to say, that's a bricklayer's nightmare. <laughs> working with them. These, these are approximately 42 pounds each. These ones here are approximately 30 pounds each. And then of course there's a four inch standard gray or four inch or 100 millimeter. There's a 15 centimeter standard gray and a 25 centimeter standard gray, which we don't have here. Are the architectural blocks 30 pounds as well? Yeah, they're, they're approximately 30 pounds. One thing, these here, the colored ones to get the color that they want they typically the architectural block are made with a heavyweight material not a lightweight material like the standards okay are. great and uh les was telling us all before we get started that the reason that they actually kind of have some of these grooves in the block that you'll see is so that a mason can lift it with one hand so he was showing us how we do that so here's that it's, it's beveled on the top. There's the bottom of the block, a wider flange on the top. Most masons will pick it up like this, set it in the wall. And he's doing that so easily, but again, remember the weight of that block and he just picked it up with one hand and showed us how to do that. We were amazed. <laughs> well, the, the, the gentleman in the field will handle 150 to 200 of those a day. I'd probably conk out after about 30 yeah. today. <laughs> so with that being said, we now, you have seen the base of the wall, you've seen how the bond beams exist in an actual workshop, it's a bit different setup over here, but now Candy, our resident brick expert here, is going to be going through some standard brick sizes and some information on different bricks that we have outlaid for you guys. So something about the brick world, most of it is made out of clay. Uh, there are some shale bricks out there and I'm sure there's recycled contents and different types of brick around the world that I don't know about yet, but it's always a learning experience. Your most common brick that you're going to use on most structures is a modular brick, two and a quarter high, seven and five eighths long. This is a matte texture or a grain tex. Different manufacturers call this same texture different names. So we'll stay with grain tex because that's the way I learned it. Uh, again, it's modular, so it modules out to a standard, onto a soldier, header, all of those different things. This is again, another modular brick, but it's a smooth texture. I believe they roll the surface of it so that the 
Recycled content, which is the grog, doesn't get drugged down and create the texture on the surface. Another one, again, another modular, but it's rumbled. When you're doing a rumbled brick, they produce it just like this, but they put it in a big rumbling tunnel that goes over and over and it, you lose about 50% when you're doing it, but it gives you that nice crushed face on it. Lots of different textures. Again, every different manufacturer has different textures. Where's the other one? I lost it. <laughs> Regardless, they're all right here. Different sizes that are common. Again, your modular is gonna be your number one go-to. This is one of the bigger units that come in brick. It's a giant brick is the way that I learned the name. These are made for big commercial structures. You put it on a smaller area, you're gonna have a lot of wastage, a lot of cuts. You wanna make sure these are big long runs of walls on commercial buildings. Other than that, I believe, I guess the weight is important. 3.6 pounds for a modular brick. You can get around 12 pounds or something like this. Did I get it all? I think you sure did. So we have our block, we have our bricks, and how do we put a wall together? Well, we couldn't put the wall together without mortar. So Candy's gonna be mixing some mortar live on camera for you all and talking about the importance of mortar, especially using a pre-baked mortar. So as we're going through this, I've pre-mixed some for less because he needs it done. When you mix mortar, you wanna make sure you mix it for about five minutes, let it sit for about five minutes, remix it again, and then it's ready to go. We like to use pre-bag mortars because of the consistency in that bag. The way that they used to do it years and years ago before pre-bag existed was four shovels of sand, one shovel of cement, and half a shovel of wine. You can see where those mixtures can really get all wonky in your wall. So pre-mixed is the best way to go. The two most common types of mortar are type N, which would be for compression. Type S would be more sheer bond strength. We're using type S today because I had a plethora of the bags here and it just works. I'm gonna take it apart before it dries anyway. Okay, and what's the importance of, why do you have to use this electric mixer here? So again, you're mixing for five minutes. A lot of, a lot of the ways they used to do it would be a rake, which we don't have a rake here. But Sorry, what would you call a it? Hole. A hole, garden hole. He just called me a hole. I'm not sure if I like that. <laughs> Regardless of that, they would mix it in a wheelbarrow, different types of situations. Again, you're not going to get the consistency when you're mixing it by hand as you would with a power drill. So this is what we like to do. We're going to start out with just a tiny bit of water in the bottom. I'm going to dump in some mortar. Should really have a mask on because I'm going to have mortar nose hairs after this. more water, a little more uh, mortar as you're going. But you never want to do that after you started using the mortar and you're installing with it. Every time you remix mortar, it decreases the strength of it by 50%. So mix it once, use what you can. Depending on the weather outside, you want to use as much as you can in about an hour. Again, I'm not going to mix for five minutes because of the timeline we're running on right now. Give your trowel there. Inside the bucket, I only mixed a little bit. It's not a full bucket by any means. Let's see if I mixed it right. Stays on, a little flick, it comes off. So that's how you know that texture is correct, is you take your trowel, you lift a little bit out like so, play around with it, make sure it stays on, turn it upside down, should still stay on a little bit, flick, and we're good to go. 
and that is how you mix margarine. Yeah, and now, you want to go over the tools? yes, so Les is going to be talking about some of the tools that it takes to build a wall for you all. So we're going to go in one by one and we're going to talk about some of the tools. He, of course, has the trowel always in a ha his hand. According to him, the trowel never leaves a mason's hand. Yeah, and here's the bolster. Uh, in the olden days, what we used to do, this is what you'd cut your brick with. You'd mark a brick to cut. Then you take the bolster, put it on there, tap the top of the hammer until it's split. This is a plugging chisel. These are used more on restoration work, historical restoration. You put the, the bevel then facing outwards, put the point of the chisel in, and then as you hit it down with a hammer, it knocks the mortar out. There's a mesh hammer you use for, this is typically used when we're breaking stone. This is a raker. This is to achieve a recess joint. You rake out the joint and then you finish it off with what's called a slicker or flat joiner. If you want a concave finish, you use a round joiner. And then there's different widths for the joints. So that if you have a tight joint, use a smaller end. If you have a wider joint, use a little bit wider. And mainly brick are, are 190 mil long or seven and five eighths. On average to have a three eighths of an inch joint, bed joint and or vertical joint. Because brick have a, a variance they can be that's a, one of the beauties about mortar. It helps make up the difference when the material is either smaller, longer, shorter. Here's, this is a margin trowel, this rectangular shaped one. And this here is a pointing trowel. Pointing trowel just used mainly when we're patching around pipes that have been, that go through uh, walls. And margin trowel is used sometimes just to, to help smooth out the base of the brick or the bed joint of the brick. I don't know if you want to step back a little bit here. These blocks are laid in what's called a stack bond. So it's basically one block stack straight upon, up above the other. And the other common bond is running bond where each row on top roughly splits the difference. And then of course there are other bonds like a Flemish bond, which would be a stretcher the end of a brick is called a header and stretcher again, and you go down the wall. This is more of a decorative bond. You don't see it too often here. It's used more in the olden days to tie two or more wides, wides of brick together when you had multiple width walls. Okay, I will. Well, I think we have a question, so we might stop and answer the questions before we get started on building out the walls. So Nicholas asked, what can be done if the texture is incorrect? Is it okay to add more moisture to the mixture after initial mixing? How long is the time frame that it can be corrected? You can add more water after you have up, in general, they like you to use the mix, whatever, when the mix is made, you've got up to two hours to use it. Of course, weather pays, plays a big part of it. If it's hot, you got to mix it more often. If it's cold, you don't have to temper it as much. The secret is what we try to do on site, <clears throat> only mix what we're going to use in roughly we try and work half hour, one hour modules. Okay, so and if the, the texture is incorrect, then you can just quickly add some, um, some sand or water or so just forth water. before. Okay. Just water. There's a great thing about the pre-mix mortar because all the everything's put in proportionally. We don't have to worry. Um, before, I think one thing that we used to do is when we put in actual lime, the lime gives it the workability for the mason. So they we'd sometimes might put a little extra lime in to have a little more workability and elasticity to the mortar. Plus, the lime give it a great finish. Okay. So if you are doing restoration projects would you be mixing those components yourself or would you still use a pre-baked mortar? Well, fortunately nowadays we can go to Spec Mix who mixes the majority of the mortar. We can give them either type O or type 
Uh, what is it? Type O and no M is thick. Type O mortar, you can, we can give the specifications to spec mix and they will pre-mix it. Otherwise what we'll do is we'll have a big tub. We'll slake lime, let the lime cure for X few days. And then on site, we can mix it with the whole war with the drum mixer to whatever we need. But restoration mortar or is, is typically uh, a lot different. It's, it's a lot weaker than the, the mortars that we use today on, on buildings. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know they were traditionally a bit more weaker. A lot weaker. In fact, there's some projects you, that are just lime and sand. Oh, wow. And then the, the, here's the advantage to me, the lime and sand with the higher lime, can, lime content, you got less cracking in your finished joints. Okay. So would, do we traditionally, so traditionally there'd be less cracking than you would see in mortar nowadays? In the old days, yeah, there was less cracking. Okay, but good to know. We use a stronger mortar now and it, it's rigid. And if whatever we're building on, either be it on angle line or on a concrete ledge, if, if there's, if the product hasn't settled or cured enough and any movement always shows up in the brick joints with the brick joints crack. So that's why it's extremely important to account for differential movement between especially wood frame and masonry so that you don't get those cracks in that mortar. Yeah, it's not so much the wood frame, it's more the more what's holding the brick up at the base. Okay, perfect. Good to know. So now uh, Les is going to show us how to lay some bricks the proper way and then we're going to get Candy in here and show you how an amateur can do it. Because we're laying bricks, come off to the side, cut our trowel into what we want to put on the wall, we pick it up with the trowel, I'll go over this way, we put it down, pull the trowel back, spread the mortar, and then we twirl it. And then whenever we have a cavity, we try and bevel it backwards to the back to slow down or stop the excess mortar going into the cavity. So when we're laying the brick, there's two ways of putting the mortar in vertical joint. You can put it in, mortar in while it's on the wall, install it. You lay the brick to the line that is there. And you try and stay the width, roughly the width of the line away from the brick to maintain a straight plane face. The other way is you can mortar the brick before it goes on the wall, the vertical joint. You slap it on a little. When you slap it on or a little more force to put it on, it helps the mortar stay in place. Same thing, lay the brick. One thing you do is when you're cutting the mud off, you don't want to hold it flush because you try not to smear the brick at the end of the day. We've got to wash it, keep the client happy. So the less mortar on the face, the better it is, or the easier it is to keep clean. So I'll just finish this roll, and then we'll get Candy in here to <laughs> show her magic. Or embarrass her magic. The other thing that you do is when you're laying the closure unit, the closure is the last unit going in the wall, you butter the brick on the wall, as well as the brick going in, you butter both ends. Do you know why they call it buttering the brick? <laughs> I don't. Maybe we can get something under there. Oh, something was in the bucket. <laughs> you know, if Candy was on a job site, the bricklayer would be giving her their thoughts. <laughs> Candy apparently isn't a great laborer or bricklayer, so. <laughs> now we'll just raise the line up for the next course. And what does the line do? The line keeps us, we put the line e even with the top of the brick that's in place. So when we're installing these brick in the wall, the field brick, we use that line to make sure that we get the brick level. We use the bottom of the brick to line up with the face of the bottom of the brick there to help keep it on the same plane. Okay. It speeds up the process of installing the brick. Okay. 
So one thing I did learn watching these guys on site is it's not unusual and probably happens more times than you think that one line is being used by two or three masons depending on the scope of your wall. So they really don't want to touch this line or the bricklayer down the row is going to lay it not level. So I will be touching it. I'll probably snap it. I'll do a whole bunch of things with it. So as an amateur, I have done this a few times in my life, but not very well. You're gonna do up here. Oh, the good. Yeah. Is that how you properly put it on for the next level? <laughs> yeah. That was better, wasn't it, was Les? Better. <laughs> Remember to cut your cut the mud on your board for the amount you want to take. Right. So that's how you know how much mud you want to take as you cut it and then take it into your trowel. And it's heavy. It's uh, you definitely have to have muscles to do this. That's nowhere close. And how she slopped it off the wall like that is that okay, or can you clean that up after, or does that have to be pretty precise? Try and do is get as you as you get more accustomed to doing this, you can limit depending on the size of your bed joint, which is your base horizontal joint. You learn to spread more or less mortar depending if you have to gain, squeeze, or stay the course. Right. So and then on to that header joint. <laughs> I'm making a heck of a mess. It's good times around these parts. Okay, so then she's trying to squeeze it on here. And then once she lays a second brick, she'll put the level on and see if she did it level. We don't have to cut, we don't have to use a level with the line there. Okay. You got more stuff in there. So she didn't lay the correct one, right? So she has to, more has to figure that out. What's really happening is I didn't clean the bucket enough before I mixed there the mud. So the old mud is, uh, is coming back to haunt me. <laughs> okay. So then she's buttering her brick. She's going to try and lay a second one. Like that, and she's just kind of gently pushing it in there. Catch your mud. And then she has and to cut her mud. Tilted so it's not on brick. I see it. So she back. has it tilted, so have to level it back out. Is that better, Les? And she forgot to cut. There she goes. Better. I think I could be a bricklayer. <laughs> in your next career. <laughs> So am I putting the appropriate amount of mud on there, Les? Yeah, you are. The only thing I'd make sure you do when you when you're furrowing the mud here, make sure the mortar comes out to the face of the brick, just so that when you your joint is full, it's just easier to tool the brick after. Ah, okay. See how much I touched that line? That guy that's down down the wall is really mad at me right now. So one thing is joint consistency. And of course, actually I'm not that bad, but I'm not that good either. Well, what, what's nice is a brick having the three holes here. When we're trying to line up our brick to make sure that we're staying on half bond, the middle of the middle hole should be in the middle of the joint of the brick below. Have I done that? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> a little a little bit. bit. Les is a resident politician here <laughs> with his diplomatic encouragement. So Candy, like myself, always struggles to put the mortar on properly. Um, Les is just able to do it with like a flick. You guys saw him. You barely <laughs> even noticed that he was doing it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're dropping it everywhere. That's a lot of mud, Les. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How thick is the mud that you're supposed to lay down? Like an, half an inch thick? 10 millimeters plus or minus. Okay. Mil. Is what the joint will end up. So you're actually putting more mud than that so you can squish it down or? You're putting it in to compress it to make sure the joint is full. Yeah, so I like half inch mud. I think that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see shortly here. We'll actually uh, get out a tape measure and measure our joints here. 
make sure that they look correct. So Candy has it lined up. As you can see, she got it in. She's gonna cut the mud now. That joint is it's tilted and the joint is not correct. As we can tell, this was a nice consistent joint we have here and that's a very thin joint. So um, already that would that brick would have to be relayed. Yes and no, all depends. Some of the bricks might be a little bit higher than others. Okay. There's a combination of usually what it is. What the reason could be why it didn't. So I'll lay this last one and then Les hopefully can fix my I'm not fixing anything. Oh, <laughs> and we're out of that brick. Okay. So again, Les said that we need to do both joints. So both sides on here. And it's just going to fall off on me anyway. And then to do it on the actual brick is very difficult for me anyway. How do you do that, Les? Here? Yeah, to get it on that front face. <laughs> I'll go around here. Put the trowel underneath. Ah. The line, don't touch the line. There you go. Or touch it as little as possible. And this trowel is massive. So to have so, the dexterity to move it around like that is one, pretty one difficult. Thing here is it's always a good idea to, as you're installing the brick candy, just to have a look if you stick your head over the wall. You got a narrow joint here and a wide joint here. Ah. So at the time of install, try and make sure you get it somewhat so they're a little more consistent in their width. Otherwise, you wouldn't be too bad. So how would you fix, because this joint's kind of not well, all that full there. So how would you fix that? So after we, if we're going to tool the wall now, we, normally, in most cases, you wait till it's thumbprint hard. So you okay. take the round joiner, you put a little bit of mortar on the trowel, put the joiner on the end of the trowel, squeeze off a little mortar, you can lift that up, fill the joint. I'll show you how that looks there. And then he's just cleaning that all up. And then when, if you see a void like that, you put a little bit more mortar in there. So he's gonna go and do this one as well, and we'll showcase how that would look after. I left a lot of holes in these bricks. Oh. So that's like a concave joint, which would be the most common jointing for any architectural controls in different developments. This is also a good moisture resistant joint. Right, because your rain and snow can come in and exit as compared to a rake. Fall off, joint. yeah. Just show them the shadow line with a rake there, Les. So we'll take a, this is a rake, or it's just got a concrete nail in. These two wheels, you set the nail to the depth of whatever recess that you're looking for. You rake it out. And then of course, after you break the vertical joints, you do the bed joint. Then you would take a flat jointer. You don't have any small ones, you need a thin one. You just take the tip of the flat jointer to give it that smooth finish, and then run it through the horizontal joint. This is actually a little bit too, too wet to be doing this right now. You wait till it's thumbprint hard then you can always make your joints look finished better. But you can see the difference between the look that you're achieving. So then would water collect in the rake joint and could it potentially scald the brick? Well, I could spall the brick more so it's gonna do damage to the mortar. Okay, and the more, that will result in the cracking of the mortar? No, the mortar will deteriorate over time and your finish will come off. And then through the freeze thaw cycles, the mortar will eventually deteriorate to the point that it has to be repointed. Okay. So if you do a concave joint, then you won't have to have as much repointing on your building? Uh, there again, it, it all depends on the situation. If you're, a more, if you're in an area, like we're in a, a great freeze thaw climate here. Yes. So if we get a lot of snow and you get a snow or rain that's 
driving the direction of the wall. If it gets below zero at night, the joint can freeze. The joint freezes. Typically, you can tell a, a joint when it's frozen. The finish crystallizes overnight, and then it's basically the, the all this the cement that's in there will not cure properly, and you should be taking down that brick immediately and re reinstalling it. Interesting. And Les is our resident sort of restoration repointing expert here at Amcan Masonry. So if anyone has any questions in that regard, feel free to pop them in the chat and we can ask them to him. So we're going to go ahead and have Les lay another course so that you can see what it looks like for a mason to lay it uninterrupted. Hey, Nicole, while we're uh, laying the bricks there, we actually have one question here with regards to the texture of the mortar. Um, okay. so the texture comes out incorrect. Is it okay to add more water to the mixture or add more pre-mixed uh, if it's not uh, wet enough? No, you'll just use, you'll just take mortar and put it on your, on your trowel if you're tooling it or jointing it to get that texture like that. Otherwise, You'll just put more water in the mortar on the mud board, mix it up. Typically, you put mortar in and we mix it like that. And, you know, fold it and whatever till we get it where we'd like it to be the consistency. And like I said before, if you're working with a board and the mortar starts curing on that board, but you're not done with the mortar, every time you add and remix water into there. You're reducing, you're reducing the strength, but the not strength not of the mortar by 50%. Not by 50. Ah, okay. See, things I learned. Yeah. No, there's more of a time that try and make sure you use your mortar with one or two hours. I think two hours is the maximum allowed. But if it's hot out, you want to you wanna use it up quicker. In fact, the same thing when we're spreading mortar on a wall. If it's a 30 degree day, we may only spread enough mortar for three bricks. If it's a day like today where it's you know eight to ten degrees we might spread the mud for 15 to 20 bricks okay. as long as the, the moisture isn't being drawn out of the mortar because once it gets directed dry in forest whether it be clay or whether it be a concrete block it gets it's absorbed at different times the big thing is at the end of the day when you're tooling it you want to tool it till it's thumbprint hard. If it's too wet when you tool it, because that this process after we're done joining it, you take the carpet or a brush, you brush it off at a 45 degree angle to take the edges off. We call them snots. And then that just drops any sort of flex or anything that gets there. Yeah, and then we go over it with the jointer again. So of course, that's why you're probably trying to lay them as well as possible the first time so you don't have to do that extra jointing. Well, the, the one thing that too, I guess they should have said is that <clears throat> once once you set the brick and if, the, if too much moisture is drawn out before you set the brick and then you go to adjust the brick, you, you break the bondage between the brick and the mortar. Okay. So you want to set it while the, the workability, the consistency allows you to get it in without breaking the bond, bondage. So if you want to come over here, I'll just do... So we'll see how this is laid here. So he's moving the line over. The line. I always want to call it the string because it is string, but it's your line. It's much more important than just string. So he just slashes that mud mortar on so quickly. There you go. And you furrow it. Might want to come to this side. Yeah, see, see, Alan speaking. If someone can mute their, their hey, good, video, good. How are you doing? Can you mute that? Who's ever on the phone, please mute your video. 
So far, I've had like two responses back. So, All right, Al, Al, Alan's following up by phone. Please mute your guys. Yeah, your name. You know, let me know. Some guys think they want to use Zoom, and I'm cautioning them. No, don't. No, we don't, we don't want to okay, use Zoom. Somebody else mentioned phone, WebEx. Please mute yourself. There we go. Um, Hey, Nicole, I can't seem to mute him from here, so you may need to see if you can mute him on your end. Yeah. Nicole, Nicole, it looks like you just muted yourself there. So we can't hear yeah. you. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, if you can mute yourself, please. Oh, hold, hold on. Yeah, Luke, can I give you a call back? I've got somebody calling me here on the, um, I don't know what they're using. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, no, they're, they're, they're using, I, I'm on a, a webinar and somebody's just asked me a question. Alan, um, we can hear I'll your give whole you a call conversation, back please mute yourself. Okay, all right, thanks. Right. Alan, we can hear your entire conversation, please mute yourself. So Les is doing this other second course. You can just see he just threw down that mortar and he's like placing those bricks there. So quick. I'm a horrible laborer. I'm not even passing a brick anymore. <laughs> so would your laborer pass you brick on the nope. job site? They put them on the stack and behind so they're easily accessible to the brick there. So he just laid two courses in that time frame, just like that, where when Candy and I did it last time, we couldn't even lay two bricks, not even two bricks in the same time frame. So, and he laid two courses. So that's pretty impressive. And then, like we said, he would go through and do that. So we have some questions in the chat here. Um, what is the quick test to decide if the mortar has too much moisture drawn out. And David said to everyone, um, and Les can correct if this is correct, Victoria, the flick test is common to test if the mortar has the appropriate amount of moisture. If you hold a small amount of mortar on a vertically oriented trowel, it should stay until you flick your wrist and the mortar will release. And that's how we tell, right? That that's the moisture is good? The other, the other same thing is once, once it's, Mortars on the board. We don't have a lot here, but when we can roll the mud and kind of keep it together, when it cracks like that, that means it's too dry. So then we would add a little bit of bit of water to yeah. the mortar, right? Yeah, we'll put a little. So that then Les would have a bit of this cup of water. The laborer again fell short and didn't mix enough mud. So we just put a little, same I guess pretty well if you're baking where you do a well, flour, do a little well, add a little bit of water, take it. Many different ways to mix mixing the mortar or trying to blend it. You try and get it to a, it's a nice consistency. And a lot of times the guys that are working with us every day can tell by the way that they use the, their trowels to move the stuff. So pick it up and pretty well all stay together there. So it's, it's good. So just like how a baker would over time get to know how wet her dough is supposed to be, the same thing would be with a mason and his mortar? Correct. Okay. That's a great question. When the mortar's at a, a great water content and the workability is high, a mason will get a lot more units in. Okay. okay. If it's too dry, he's got to tap it down with a trowel. 
if it's too wet, he's got to let it sit so some of the moisture is drawn out naturally before he can lay the brick. Otherwise, what will happen is as you start putting more rows on, if the mortar is really wet, the brick will set or sink when you put the next layer on. So when you lay block, for instance, since it's heavier, would the mortar need to be a bit drier so you wouldn't have that sinking? Yes, it would. Perfect. Good to know. So for any of you who go to sites, that's something to keep in mind is that the mortar for blocks have to be a bit drier um, so you don't have that sinking. Candy had to learn that lesson that hard way when she originally tried to lay some of these blocks for the setup. They started to sink because she was used to mixing mortar for bricks. Um, and so she makes the mortar a bit too wet for the blocks. And I was sore for the next three days. It's unbelievable. I only laid nine blocks like this. It, it was a horrible job, but you have to learn somehow. And uh, I still can feel it in my glutes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So we have about just 15 minutes left here. So with that being said, is this now would be the time to ask these resident experts any questions about masonry and so forth. You can see Candy over here as well jointing. Um, Candy, can you just demonstrate for them again what a vertical and horizontal bed joint is? So again, this is your horizontal bed joint. This is your vertical, it's still quite sticky. So I always, uh, the way Les explains it, I've done a lot of tiling in my life. And when you're tiling, it's the same thing with the grout. You need to leave it depending on the weather of that day. But so your thumbprint, you can see it and it's not, see how wet that is. It's very difficult to tool. Down here now, it's a little bit too dry, but you can still make it happen. And it, it, if it's a little drier when you join it, it doesn't affect the shape of the mortar when you join it. Okay, it just great. Makes it tougher to and then she's brushing that off there. And Les, if you're able to, can you showcase a little bit about uh, what soldiering would look like and so forth? So you've seen the different, how they're laid, the different looks here, but of course you can put the, the brick vertical like that. Yeah, this, this would be a soldier course. And, and when Candy was saying, oops, modular earlier, Modular, basically what works nice is three brick will work out to one brick. And in fact, that's how we do our coursing for heights as well. So it just stays consistent. So standing straight up is vertical. This is what you call a row lock. These are typically used mainly on uh, window sills and tops of walls. And this is called just a header course. So that, that'd be more on the ends of the walls where you've got to return to keep your bond on the half brick running bond. Or if you're doing a decorative bond, like Flemish bond or a common bond. There's many different patterns and that you can use. Yeah, you, you can, can do dog tooth. Yeah, herring bone, herring which is bone. laying at 45 degrees. We can get you a list of all the common ones that are used, but again, your imagination can be used with brick as well. There, having said that, the, the more decorate, decorative you put into the wall, the more labor intensive it is, which there more increases the cost of that okay. wall. And how do you break the brick in half to get this just like header course there? Well, Nowadays, a lot of times they'll use a saw. Otherwise, we'd take a hammer, in the middle of the hole, tap the front, and you got your two headers or two halves. And it works just like that to keep, get your roll lock or that header course on your wall. Right. And the nice thing is you get to use the two finished ends so you don't have to worry about the rough side at the back. Perfect. Another good thing for different manufacturers, everyone has to have one good face, one good end. Different manufacturers manufacture differently. Some have two good faces, some have two good ends. Some are good four sides. So really watch what your specifications are. are. Yeah, some are face only, depending on where you're getting it from. So watch your specifications. That's where we can really help you as we know what each different manufacturer is, or we will research it for you. 
So I had a funny question here. How many fingers have you lost doing that with the hammer? Did it take a while to figure out that skill? Well, it takes a while. Actually, <laughs> times have changed. I started my apprenticeship in 1978. And when we had to cut an electrical outlet or a pipe into a, a block wall, we had to be able to do it with a hammer <laughs> and, and the sharp end of the hammer. Today, we're fortunate we have saws. Same with the bolster. The bolster was a big part of cutting your halves. You'd put it on, on top of your brick once you marked it out. Slight tap just to score it a bit, and then the whack. These are an afterthought. When I started out, they weren't there. It's more, more the, not your fingers, but it's more from using your chisels. You'd miss the end of the chisel and freaking bruise up your hand <laughs> a lot. Now, there was some cases it doesn't happen very often. Because some bricklayers, what they will do is they'll use some guys. Your trowel over time gets very sharp from sliding it on the brick and block all the time. So some guys used to make their break their halves instead of using a hammer, they'd use a trowel. And I have I know of two guys that cut the ends of their thumbs off. Doing it that way. Yeah. So if you're not careful, accidents happen. But that's pretty rare nowadays. Yeah, everybody typically for any cuts of any size, length or whatever, they're all cut with a with a power saw that we have on site. A table saw. We have smaller table saws for brick, larger table saws for block. So even though everyone, not everyone has less capability, um, we do have saws on site, so we can keep that safety in check. Okay, so there's some other questions here. I've seen details showing through wall flashings at the base of masonry with slope over top the ledger, of course. This isn't possible as the masonry would be bearing on the flashing, making it flat. Suggestions for having a through wall flashing at the base of masonry to promote drainage. Some have suggested trying to slope a setting bed underneath the flashing. That would be difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> then, because then what you're going to have to do is underneath your flashing at the back, you're going to have to have a little bit of mortar, put your, put your flashing down with no, no mortar on the front to get that slope. That, that, uh, that would be awfully hard. And if you're using a, a metal flashing, they actually can be a little more difficult to work with, depending on, you know, when you're laying it on an angle iron, everything is typically nice and true and straight. When you're working with concrete, because the metal flashing goes up and down and there's air pockets above and below, when you're laying bricks on it, until you get a, you lay that first course like we just did, and then you lay the second course, and if the flashing isn't compressed onto the bed of where it is below the flashing, it sinks and it puts your first course out of level and out of plumb. So I know typically we, we like to work with flexible, membranes, flashings, through wall flashings. Um, it's also interesting, a lot of people have designed where they have a, a, a metal flashing that comes out with the drip edge over the face of the brick. And on, the, on many high rises that I've worked on or been a part of, the owners don't like the flashing sticking out. They, they at times believe it ruins the aesthetics of the look of the wall. The other thing when it's down in the ground, the metal flashings, get hit from lawn, lawn mowers, shovels. People's um, ankles. Pe well, yeah, <laughs> at least the flashing winds have that one usually, <laughs> but, and they get, they get damaged a lot. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's a tough, tough call. We always find that yeah, we know what the our consultants, the architects and engineers want, but at the end of the day, if, if the client that owns the building is happy, we typically give in to what, they request as long as it is uh, discussed with the consultant so they know why it was done. Okay, great. And one thing that we didn't cover was weep holes. So maybe we should talk about that on the discussion of moisture. Or we can just do it here. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and showcase how that's done here. So a weep hole is just an airspace at the, in the brick. This would be on the first course. There'd be no mortar put in between the ends of the two brick. And then of course there's uh, 
typically we use a plastic brick vent that would fit in there or there's some corrugated or some people just leave leave it open and you build up the wall so this would be let's say if this was the base of the wall if any moisture gets into the cavity behind the brick from anywhere it can drain down come out the bottom and drip out the other thing is you leave also vents at the top of the wall the vent also at the top of the wall allows the air to circulate to help keep the cavity or help dry out the cavity if it gets wet and keep the air circulating <clears throat> a great thing about brick on for cavity wall construction or for veneer is in the winter the brick heats up if it's a hot day 30 35 some of the warm air gets trapped in the cavity and then the same thing in the winter the brick may freeze more the cold will go through and then some of the cool air gets trapped in the cavity so it helps a little bit there is no r value as far as i know and it just helps helps with the cool and or heat of the wall so we can showcase to um the importance of kind of laying that brick cleanly so you don't get mortar in between there. So you can see when Candy laid it, we had mortar everywhere, all between the two <laughs> courses of the brick there, it's everywhere. Um, and then of course, when Les threw it up there in like two seconds, you can see that there's no mortar in between those two courses there. So, um, that as well helps mitigate when you have that skill. Um, you're not getting mortar into those cracks dripping down like when Candy did it over here. And then nowadays we put what's called mortar net. It's a porous plastic material that'll be typically go in at the base because there, it's, as hard as the guys try, there is uh, typically mortar will drip down the cavity. And by having the mortar net, you know, it's anywhere from probably six to 12 inches high <clears throat> and it's it's uh, I don't know what you call it, like a castle it's goes up and down like that but the mortar net gets a chance to breathe as well and the mortar gets a, um, an area to escape so we have one last question I think well we have uh, time for just a couple more questions here um, you just answered Nicholas question so it's a thing for that with the mortar mesh um, we have another question here. Does mortar bond to flexible through wall flashing membranes? So does that mortar bond to that, that through wall flashing that you just talked about? Not very good. Not well, I wouldn't imagine so. <laughs> um, that would be two different one, materials. One detail I see a lot of, a lot of that can be good or bad. If you're using a, a through wall flashing that typically has, a, has bitumen at the back, uh, you should leave one inch Keep the face of the the flashing one inch from the face of the brick or block. Um, if it's extremely hot out, and you they take the flashing right out to the edge of the brick, especially a flexible flashing, and it gets hot out in time, that bitumen will seep and weep down the wall. Yeah, he said he figured as much, but that was a really good question to ask. Um, if anyone has any questions feel free to ask them there are no dumb questions here you should have seen candy and i with the setup with les we were asking him all the most ridiculous questions so i could barely even hold the trowel properly i have really small hands so i couldn't figure out the flick of it okay um this is a really good question we actually have a triple a presentation on this by the way Last one from me, thoughts on sealants compatible with masonry. Any major concerns, example, silicone? Uh, one thing I believe that's bad about silicone, you gotta make sure that whatever is being used is, is breathable. We've seen a lot of cases where people sometimes will paint over brick or they're not happy with whatever's being used as a sealant on brick. And if you get a driving rain or it's extremely, uh, wet or moist out, moisture will always go through. It ends up, it ends up in time. It spalls the front of the wall. I, I'm not a big fan of big fan of paint or many silicones going on. And 
the other unfortunate part is it's, it is an expensive part of that wall. And when you put it on, depending on the area that you live in, it's only good for anywhere up to seven years. So they always give you the max. They say it's good for seven years. If you're in an area that gets a lot of rain, driving rain, that could be knocked down to three, four years. Yeah, that's good to know. And another thing to add to with sealants um, is if you have moisture coming in that isn't isn't being managed properly with your building envelope so then that sealant will actually trap that wa water from getting out through that brick naturally and it will trap that against your wall so you have to make sure that you're not efflorescing with a problem with your building envelope any, any sealant you're going to use you want to make sure it's breathable and it's made for masonry so those are the two things i would look for i still would never seal a brick unless food is coming in contact so if you're using brick slices and putting it as your backsplash in your kitchen, that's when I would use a sealant just so you can wipe that spaghetti sauce off if it splashes up on it. But other than that, where would you use a sealant? I wouldn't. I, I prefer not yeah. to use it. Yeah, so they say you prefer not to. And, and for um, many reasons. It does it in time and if the face starts falling and, and mm -hmm. deteriorating as well. And you'll see that on some of the, some of the older buildings downtown, you know, at 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. I mean, it's great that they last. And even the one thing I will say about, even though the mortars were a lot weaker back then, it's amazing how they have with. Withstood it over the yeah, test of time. Yeah, centuries test of time sometimes, is, is, yeah. Is, it's incredible. And like I said, uh, the Alberta Masonry Council has that triple A presentation on managing efflorescence. And we do talk about sealants within that. So if that was a question on um, how you were wondering about any sealants as a result of managing efflorescence, please reach out to me and we can do that presentation for you guys. So we just have one more question here. Is there a rule of thumb on locating vertical expansion joints, i.e. every 10 feet, et cetera? Uh, typically, it's, it's, we've had them where they've requested them with six meters, eight meters, 12 meters apart. I think it all depends on the soil that the building is being built on. And okay. as well as if they decide to put a, a, a joint in the concrete below or at the angle irons or at the side of openings. I just want to make one more comment on efflorescence. One of the one something that typically happens on site, if this was a veneer wall, we build the wall up and we get it up to the top. And if whatever they're using for the parapet isn't put on immediately and moisture goes down the cavity, the brick gets set wet at the back and it comes out and you see the efflorescence on the face of the brick. Unfortunately, we, the bricklayers get a bad rap for this. It's typically out of their control because it's mainly it's a joiner general contractor, the roofer that has to put the cap flashing on. And if that cap flashing isn't put on right away and we get some heavy duty rains or even snowfalls, you will get efflorescence. So if you're ever out there and you see top of wall where it's complete, you should just ask whomever you're doing the work, whomever's doing the work, if they could get a, a flashing or whatever, if they're putting plywood underneath, even that helps. So that's really good to know that that flashing is important and that's something to be looking for at site. Right. During construction. During construction. Okay, we have another question here. Would you use sealant, example silicone, and backer road at expan sorry, backer rod at expansion joints? I would. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's actually works well. The unfortunate part, of course, about any any caulking is that it you never the lifespan is usually never more than a couple of years and then it needs to be worked on. Okay, so that answers that question. So you can use it in that case. Good good question, everyone. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for everyone that attended. For those of you that don't know, we do a draw. Um, during this. So we'll go ahead and do our draw here. So maybe Candy, can you choose? We have a lot of people on here. Can you choose a number between maybe one and 10? Three. Three. Okay. So that is going to Nicholas.
Fuzz. I'm not sure if I pronounced your last name wrong, but that is yours. So you get that sweet DoorDash gift card. Good job. And uh, I'll have David send me your contact information or someone, I'll look for your contact information there, or you can email me and we'll send off that DoorDash gift card. Um, the reason we choose DoorDash is they've been supporting local uh, restaurants with takeout and free delivery. And so we're just trying to keep local restaurants alive during this time frame. So thank you for everyone that attended. The questions don't have to stop here. Amcan Masonry is absolutely fantastic. They are a wealth of knowledge and experience. So please feel free to reach out to them with any projects that you have coming up. Um, they have so much to offer you with uh, details to offer for your design and so forth. So with that, we will leave it off. Thank you for everyone for joining. Wave you goodbye. Thank you. And they all say thank you. Aww. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs>